Right. Um, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all our participants attending this uh, webinar today on uh, cybersecurity training and skilling platform from Cyberbit. Uh, thank you for taking your time off from your busy schedules to know more about uh, Cyberbit's cloud range offering. My name is Murli Velat, and I'm the division head for the corporate security division of Bulwark. I'm really excited to introduce to you the team from Cyberbit. We have Jade Carver, who is the director of sales for the region, and Tony Rowan, who is a cybersecurity training expert from uh, Cyberbit. We are actually at a critical stage, and uh, the need of the hour is to address the skills gap for the SOC teams across the region. Uh, if you look at a SOC survey that was conducted by SANS in 2019, they revealed that the number one barrier to SOC excellence is a lack of uh, skill resources. I'm sure you know, you've seen a lot of news where uh, there's this big gap in terms of what is available in the market and what is expected. And uh, since the COVID-19 outbreak, the training for stock, uh, SOC staff in the region has actually been put on hold. So this obviously impacted the skills that are there currently. And I'm sure that uh, from this webinar, you will see how Cyberbit's initiative in terms of offering the cloud range, we can help SOC teams to train and develop their skills wherever they are located while practicing these uh, new skills required for responding to incidents uh, as a distributed team. Uh, so the agenda for day, today would be a quick introduction to Bulwark and uh, the Cyberbit range. Uh, it will be followed by a live demo from Tony, and we will take the Q&A session towards the end. Uh, you're, of course, welcome to use the chat window to post in your, um, your queries, and uh, Tony and Jade would address this uh, once the presentation is done. Uh, with that, I would give you a brief about uh, Bulwark. I think most of you are already aware. Bulwark is a value-added distributor, a specialized cybersecurity VAD in the region. We've been here for the last 20-plus years providing niche information security products to the GCC region, North Africa, and India. We work very closely with our partners. We've got over 500 plus partners across the region whom we engage on a regular basis with, uh, selling some of the solutions that we have from 22 plus vendors uh, who we represent in the region, who are cutting edge technologies uh, with Cyberbit being one of them. So the solutions that we actually carry uh, is a very strong value proposition in the market that actually is able to address the critical requirements and needs of our uh, customers. In fact, uh, we have a presence in almost all key verticals uh, across the region with a dedicated channel network to help us increase the footprint. We also have a very strong uh, team of dedicated sales force to help these partners achieve their business objectives to be able to take a win-win approach <coughs> and close deals across. Um, yes, so uh, with that, I would now uh, like to hand over the presentation to Jade, who will be able to provide you with an insight into their solution. Over to you, Jade. Great. Thanks, Morali. Um, really appreciate everybody's time this morning and just want to echo what um, what the team at Bulwark have said. Uh, you know, we, we're pretty excited to have the opportunity to present everybody today. Obviously, the, the, the purpose of today is to uh, get you guys familiar with uh, the solution that we have, which is a uh, cyber, cyber range. Um, Tony and myself are going to split this presentation from our side into two parts. I'll, I'll set the, the scene um, from a landscape point of view. Morali's obviously touched on that to, in a short point in any case around the shortages. And then I'll hand over to Tony um, to go into the products in a bit more detail and also cover the, um, uh, the demo front. So um, just a little bit about Cyberbit, as I'm uh, you know, pretty sure most of you are not too familiar with us. Um, so we're most certainly a global leader in um, the Cyber Range platform. If any of you have come across um, this vertical uh, in the past, you, you know, it really falls into two, two sort of areas. And uh, we've gone down the path of trying to make it a little bit more um, realistic and, uh, as, as we call it, hyper-realistic using a simulation-based platform. We've been, in, we've been in the market since uh, 2013. Um, we're around 150 people globally, obviously offices all over the world. And uh, we've raised just over 100 million in, um, in funds. Our last round was, uh, was in May, and that was uh, in a, a good amount of investment from Charles Bank. So uh, one of the biggest challenges, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, in, in this space that we're, we're facing at the moment around cybersecurity um, and the, the demand that uh, we are seeing and ultimately what has brought about our company is the, the shortage in skilled cybersecurity staff. 
as you can see on the slide at the moment, in 2019, there was just over 4 million people globally um, that, uh, um, or jobs, weren't actually filled due to the shortage. It's, it's no secret, and uh, obviously you guys being on the front line selling technologies to your customers will have first-hand experience that uh, a lot of the time, um, customers are obviously investing in great uh, bits of technology, whether that be an endpoint, a, a firewall, whatever the case might be. And inevitably, what, what happens is they do a point train for an individual. So those individuals, you know, get skilled up on that exact product. But most certainly when it comes to um, organizations that then have a soft team, this is where the, the skill shortage is really, um, you know, being pushed to the forefront. As you can see, the, um, you know, the EU and, uh, you know, from my point of view, um, I, I would obviously class Middle East uh, under, the, under the EU banner. We've got, you know, just under 300,000 uh, unfilled jobs. I think with the, the phenomenal growth around digitalization and the smart push in the Middle East in particular, um, this number is probably going to grow dramatically in your region, which ultimately uh, represents um, a good opportunity not only for us, but for our partners as well to address the skill shortage um, for our customers. So one of the, 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 the key drivers in, in this area um, is, you know, many markets are obviously are feeling the impact of the cybersecurity shortage. You know, it doesn't make a difference if you're an enterprise or, you know, from an educational point of view, that, uh, they are really struggling to find qualified uh, cyber practitioners. So, uh, you know, you can see a study again last year that, uh, you know, 74% of cybersecurity professionals, you know, uh, felt that the organization had been impacted by the skill shortages. So what, what we're seeing when we speak to customers is um, uh, one or two things will generally be happening. Either um, they would, uh, you know, have somebody wearing dual hats um, and, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, comes back to the old saying, you know, you're a jack of all trades, but a master of none, which means that the individual becomes less efficient at the actual job they were hired to do. Or on the other, on the other hand, when they bring junior people into the organization or into the SOC team, they're having to shadow um, the more senior people to kind of learn as they go on. And this skill shortage most certainly has a direct impact on, on the individuals that are working within that, uh, that marketplace. Um, and the, the, the negative impact back to the organization, not only is the morale of the individual, but also the, the opening of a, a cyber threat that really could come off the back of, um, you know, either them wearing a dual hat or obviously having to teach somebody on, uh, you know, as, as they've joined the organization. So the shortage is, is uh, you know, not only focused around um, uh, uh, our industry on its, on its own, but, but uh, somewhat larger, right? So 61% of organizations feel that half of the applicants that are applying for the jobs are not qualified. So you'll see later in this presentation that um, not only is, is the product that, that we've developed great at continuously upskilling the individuals, but some of the more unique use cases is actually around, um, if you look at it from an HR point of view and the hiring process, many individuals on paper, you know, might have the, the skills for a job, but again, because they've never really been exposed to that, uh, that, that uh, real life incident, when it comes to actually um, fulfilling the, the role in, in a practical sense, um, that they're not qualified for the job. So again, when you look at that full ecosystem of uh, individuals coming into a SOC team or, or leaving university, the tool that we've developed you know, can, can not only help continue to upskill them, but also help as part of that hiring process. So the top uh, top three cybersecurity candidate qualifications are, you know, um, and and it's it's sad, but it's it is true. Prior hands-on experience, right? This this is probably one of the 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 key indicators for any hiring manager when he looks at a CV and speaks to a candidate. Them having prior hands-on experience is going to be one of the highest um, uh, key factors that they would look for, because in that instance they know that the individual has dealt with a cyber attack before that they've, they've experienced a real world threat. Uh, number two is going to obviously going to be credentials. So again, you know, have they gone through all the various courses? Have they done a SANS course? You know, uh, are they proficient at the, the network tools that that uh, organization is using, whether it be certain firewalls, certain uh, SIM uh, tools, et cetera? And then number three is, is around hands-on training. Um, and this comes back to the point that I, that I raised before. If you look at um, most organizations, the way they deal with onboarding, 
it is down to um, a senior person training a junior person. Um, now, if you look at a lot of individuals that work within SOC teams, they aren't necessarily going to be extroverts by nature, um, which means the way in which they would generally teach somebody isn't going to be um, uh, in the same way as somebody going to do a course, right? Um, it, it's going to be a little bit uh, um, point and shoot, do X, and then you'll see a result of Y, as opposed to you know, trying to educate the person by allowing them, them to explore the boundaries and then guiding them when they've gone wrong. But you can see on the right hand of the screen, um, obviously, the, the, the different um, levels of importance um, are, are spread across, obviously, the different uh, um, areas of, uh, of, if I call it expertise, within an organization when they're obviously trying to qualify an individual. I think the, 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 the important, of the, um, the highlight for me from this is, again, as I mentioned before, the top one, which is uh, you know the prior hands-on cyber experience, you can see this really far outweighs any of the other, um, if I call it uh, security qualifications that somebody would have a look at when they come into a, an organisation. So the skill shortage, um, uh, you know, is is most certainly today's number one cyber security challenge. Um, we, we're all very familiar with new technologies coming to market that most certainly will address different threats within the security landscape. But ultimately, um, the organization still has the fundamental problem of the individual that's behind that technology having to utilize it and protect the organization. From, from Cyberbit's point of view, we, we, we use the analogy of um, a, 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 an airplane pilot that you know, does all these theoretical course and never does any work within a sim. You know, and the first time that uh, you're then expecting that, that pilot to fly an aeroplane, uh, you know, is in the real world. You know, none of us would actually get on an aeroplane with, with a pilot that's doing that. Um, but we almost expect our um, cyber professionals who are protecting our intellectual property and protecting our organizations to do that much in the same way. So the platform uh, that we, we are obviously developing and ta uh, taken to market is all around upskilling those individuals in a realistic real world environment. So when they are faced with the challenge in the real world, they are familiar with um, the, the scenarios and with uh, the way in which they need to deal with the, the actual cyber attack. So again, uh, you, you know, um, I, this will not be a secret to any of you guys over here. You obviously still uh, uh, security solutions and you know, the old saying goes, uh, you know, a cyber attack is inevitable. Uh, I think one of the, the, the more interesting um, uh, paths around selling cybersecurity technologies and selling a, a solution like CyberBit is the, the idea uh, that you, you normally sell on fear when it comes to a cyber product. It's not a case of if, uh, you know, it's a case of when. When you look at it from a cyber range point of view, um, the conversation totally uh, changes 180 degrees where you are speaking with a CISO or a SOC director and you've had a conversation around all the technology piece and now you're talking about actually upskilling the individuals within their organization, whether that is a known shortage of skill or you know, um, a, a theoretical um, uh, educational piece around them actually upskilling so that they can retain their staff and, and back to the key point, obviously ensuring that their network um, is uh, being handled by professionals that are you know, capable of actually doing the job. So again, it, it's, it, you, we move away from the, the, uh, the, the, the sale idea of selling on fear and that you're now selling on the investment of individuals to be able to proactively deal with cyber threats and cyber attacks within the organization. So uh, I mentioned this uh, a short while ago, but uh, you know most security teams, uh, the first time that they deal with a cyber attack is actually on the job, um, and you know by default they are unprepared. If we if we all take it from a a, a, um, a personal example, you know a lot of us you know most certainly would drive cars. We would have done our theory test. Uh, you know we would have uh, you know gone and done the actual driving test. But in between that that process, we most certainly would have had some. Um, uh, you know, tuition from a, a driving instructor or perhaps our parents or friends or family that would have got us used to the idea of actually driving on the road. We wouldn't expect somebody to, you know, go from doing nothing to, to be able and, and comfortable around, uh, you know, driving a car. And again, this is the same ethos that, that we, we see within um, the enterprise space. Um, that uh, organizations expect these individuals to come out of university or come from doing a, a cyber uh, training course 
throw them in at the deep end and, you know, almost hope that they are going to deal with the cyber threats when, when the attack unfolds. There's a couple of interesting dynamics around this, uh, this, uh, this idea as well. Um, most certainly, there, there is the idea of the individual dealing with their uh, specific component within the cyber attack. So if they are, a, you know, SOC Analyst 1 and they only deal with, um, you know, inbound ransomware or phishing attacks, you know, they most certainly can deal with that aspect. But the other aspect is actually how they uh, work within, a, within their team. Do they actually understand when they need to get um, a second person involved or need to escalate? Do they understand how the playbook um, works? You know, when do they get senior management involved? You know, at what point in time do they hand over to um, uh, another uh, department or another um, team member within their SOC team? So it's the soft skills that also needs to be learned by the individual, along with them obviously having to learn uh, uh, to actually do their, 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 their day job, which is dealing with the cyber attack. So the question that we continuously ask our customers and, and you know, we're obviously asking you today is, you know, is your team ready? Um, I think it's a, it's, a, a, it's a nice, broad and straightforward question that we ask. And, you know, based on the fact that there's, you know, over 4 million jobs that are not um, uh, backfilled at this stage, the, the, the short answer is no. We, we know people are not ready. We know their teams are not ready. The, the, the good thing is we have a solution that can help them prepare you know, these individuals and prepare their, their, their teams. Um, when Tony runs through the solution in more details, and, I, and I'm about to hand over to him, the beauty of the, of the technology is it's not only aimed at an enterprise. Uh, you know, it's most certainly aimed at higher education as well, so that when the individuals are leaving university, they're leaving with the theoretical and the practical experience, which makes life a lot easier. So again, when they're coming into the workplace, they are skilled individuals that can deal and, um, and actually uh, perform their job in a far more proficient manner. So I will hand over to Tony now. Um, he'll run through the product in a little bit more detail and, and obviously run through the, um, uh, through the demo. Obviously, as, as we've said a few times, any questions that crop up, obviously, please save them for the end of the presentation. We'll be more than happy to answer them at that point in time. Over to you, Tony. Thank you, Jay. So we've looked at the problem. We understand what the issue is around the, the problem itself. What we're going to now look at is the solution. What can we do to improve the skill sets of our personnel to make sure they have the experience? The cyber bit range, uh, allows you to train those guys and let them build up the skills piece by piece with experience, not only of the individual exercises that they need to complete, so individual skills, but also team exercises where they can exercise the team dynamic, the ability to communicate, share information, coordinate, and organize their response to a particular attack. We have a hu huge range of different scenarios covering all eventualities. This is just a small proportion that you can see on screen now. We have labs that teach individual skills, so that go through, for example, one of the ones on screen here is firewall vulnerability scanning. That's understanding from the firewall exactly what might be going on on the network and what vulnerabilities are exposed via the firewall, uh, right the way through to theory lessons, and of course, the full end-to-end -end attack scenarios covering the uh, coordinated attack, uh, all the stages of the attack, the full kill chain, and allowing a team to respond. Now that response happens on real systems. We have uh, virtual networks which contain full copies of all of the real tools, the real applications, and the real systems that uh, engineers are used to using. So they're all there, and they are not limited to what they can do on those. They can carry out full ranges of activities, investigations, changes, manipulations, etc., across all of the different systems that they're using. We have all sorts of lab categories, and we categorize them both within the MITRE framework, uh, within uh, NICE framework roles, so aligned to specific skill sets, and also uh, aligned to specific uh, organizational tool sets, like if they've got Linux experience or want to build on their Linux experience, there's a whole range of Linux exercises, Windows exercises, network forensics, uh, uh, malware reversing, encryption and decryption exercises. There's a huge range of different categories available. I'll go on to that when we do the demonstration a little. 
they can chain, go through full simulated attack chain exercises. The, uh, the t defending team wouldn't see the details. This is uh, the detail that would be seen by the person planning and selecting the particular exercise that you would like them to run. And we can use many different commercial tool sets within that range as well. So they get the full end-to-end -end attack. Uh, they get real-world and reverse engineering attacks. They get full stage attacks. They get uh, full exercise individuals and full exercises for teams. And all of that is using different combinations of well-known tools available within the system. There's automated performance evaluation and benchmarking. So at the end of the exercise, everything they've done has been measured and has been recorded, allowing us to see in the after action report precisely what they did as individuals, precisely what they did as a team. So we uh, monitor what they have carried out. We have a mechanism of measuring what they have found and how the investigation went. And we have quizzes at the end to evaluate the additional kinds of knowledge so confirmational exercises and confirmational uh, quizzes to confirm their understanding of the exercise. And through all of those different mechanism, mechanisms, we're able to get a very clear picture of both the individual skills and of the team skills. And, and those are kept within the system for as long as the uh, training coordinator wants to keep that information. We have, as we mentioned, individual exercises. So that allows, for example, a, an engineer to carry out uh, individual skills learning, viral exercises, uh, uh, exercises with the antivirus management systems, uh, EDR exercises, all of those kind of things, all the way through to full-blown, complicated team exercises. We have blue team exercises where they are the defenders. And we have red team exercises for, uh, for example, exercising the skills necessary for uh, reverse engineering of malware, for penetration testing, and other ethical hacking necessary approaches. And they're aligned. Everything that we do within the system is aligned with the National In Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, the NICE framework, where we uh, select the roles and align the skills based on the NICE framework roles and also with the MITRE ATT&CK framework, according to the tactics, techniques, and pro procedures that attackers use themselves. So an organization can look at what they believe they have in terms of the risk profile under the MITRE ATT&CK system, and then ensure that they select exercises aligned to those specific MITRE uh, techniques, te tactics, techniques, and proce uh, procedures to ensure that they're training the team for what they believe they're going to see in the real world. There are other ways of using the range as well. So we have organizations using it for obviously learning and training, and that's what it was developed initially for. But they also use it for assessment of individuals when they're joining the team. Maybe they're uh, joining from a different organization, so they can be used in uh, a way of uh, assessing their skill level for specific capabilities, uh, and also for benchmarking individuals within the team to make sure that they're making the right uh, improvements in their performance before they move on to more senior roles. We have all of that. And we also see uh, particularly HR using it to screen uh, individuals to see if they really do have the skill sets that they say they have. We also have organizations using it to sandbox their environment to test, for example, their playbooks to see if they really believe their system uh, and approach to dealing with specific kinds of attacks is fit for purpose. And they can test their playbook to ensure that their team knows what they're doing in terms of the framework of their playbook, but also that that playbook is effective at handling the kind of attack that they believe it's designed for. So it's a very widespread use case that we have for using the system. There are two fundamental models for the, uh, the range. We have the cloud range, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on predominantly today. Uh, the cloud range allows you to use the system as a cyber range as a service. So you can book it at any time from any place and use it from anywhere. So it, all it requires is a browser to access the system. Uh, and it's hosted on Amazon Web Services, and you'll, we'll show the marketplace element for that shortly. But we also provide the cyber as an on-premise solution. Uh, that gives additional facilities and is suitable for those organizations 
which have either a large throughput of personnel that they wish to train and need to exercise on a regular basis, for example, universities, uh, some colleges, and specific organizations that have large security teams like financial institutes, etc. cetera. Uh, but also for those organizations that need to make uh, specific modifications and customizations of the range to make it specific to their, uh, their needs. So we have within that system on the on-premise ranges, you can have customized networks with different tool sets involved, maybe your uh, specific mail server, specific web server, specific security tools, etc. You can also customize the scenarios within that environment to make them specific to your needs as well. And this is a common function for many government organizations uh, and military use, of course, that's where uh, we see the on-prem ranges and many universities have gone down this route as well as the finance institutes. It also allows the, the facilities uh, for the on-prem range include the ability for SCADA-based systems, so uh, like industrial control systems, and that allows them to practice responses to uh, operational technology incidents as well. So that's the major difference. Uh, the on-prem range is May, uh, very customizable for specific uh, individual organizations. Let's look at it then from the, uh, the cloud perspective. We simply go on to Marketplace and Browse to select the scenario uh, based on all sorts of different criteria, and we'll show that shortly. You select the network and tools that you want that scenario to be used with. You book your time slot, and then at the specific date and time you join, and then the scenario is able to run through automatically for you. There are two modes with that. You can have it with an instructor, and that could be an instructor from uh, Cyberbit or from a partner or even your own instructor if you wanted to have an organizational internal instructor. We have a trainer trainer system for exactly that. Uh, and then we also have the self-training mechanism where we have a virtual instructor where all of the measurement is purely and totally automatic within the system. And if they need any hints, they can uh, hit the hint button to get automated hints uh, to help them along the way. But of course, if they do that, their score would be debited accordingly. So this is an example of an on-premise range. Uh, this is fairly typical for the on-prem customers. They tend to go for a large instructor station at the front, allowing the demonstration and presentation of materials. Uh, and also the instructors have tracking stations, which the uh, trainees can't see. This is one from the Miami-Dade College. Uh, they were one of the first in the US to go down the route of a range, but there are many other universities around the world that have now invested in this because they see the strong capability of the uh, mechanism for ensuring that their personnel that they are putting through the courses have real world experience at the end. So what does this allow us to do? By using the, the training system that we've done a very quick demonstration of, uh, it allows you to decrease the training time by up to 66%. It allows the term personnel to be much more efficient in their ability to train and focus that training on specific skill sets and techniques. So make sure new hires are up to speed as quick as possible. And one example of that is new hires may well do exercises with the existing SOC team on a range to find their level and to be initiated into the activities of the team without doing that in a live environment. It helps to decrease, de decrease response time by about 26%. So it allows the team to work much faster when incidents are discovered. And faster response times mean lower costs in terms of the breach impact for the organization. It allows you to make sure you've got better talent within your security operations center and allows you to assess the capabilities of those candidates, not just as they join the team, but all the way through to make sure that they're improving in the direction and at the pace that you wish them to improve. And it also allows you to see which employees are worth continuing to invest in to make sure that they stick around and that the training investment that you've made is worthwhile to you and to them as individuals. So what we can recommend is that you take the time a bit range for a test run. Uh, what we would normally do is run a, a free training session for one scenario 
Uh, we can give you a range of scenarios to select from and let you evaluate your team and let your team play with the system through an instructor-led uh, mechanism to see just how they like it and let them see to understand exactly what they would gain by using it. And we'll also provide a full debrief uh, with the trainer, typically one of uh, myself or one of my team, uh, to give your team feedback on how well they did and what areas they were uh, perhaps slightly weak on, and also to talk about the range in general for any questions they may have on that range. Okay, I think that brings us on to questions. Any uh, questions? Right. Um, okay, so um, uh, one question comes through around the licensing model, so I'll, I'll pick that up. Um, so the, the, uh, uh, there's two versions, uh, as Tony kind of ran through. You've got the on-prem and you've got the cloud element. Uh, the on-prem is, um, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, priced per class, um, and that, that is a turnkey solution. So that would be the Cyberbit product, um, the hardware associated, as well as the third-party licensing. So if the customer decided they want a checkpoint firewall, uh, Splunk, uh, some, et cetera, um, uh, that, that is formulated around the number of concurrent classrooms that an individual wants to run. Uh, most organizations uh, tend to go for a single classroom. Um, and then the, uh, I suppose the, um, uh, the the part that is restricting uh, the size of the classroom is generally on the instructor side. So I think Tony would normally say, you know, of around, you know, call it ten, no more than fifteen individuals is is a comfortable uh, level for a face-to-face -face, um, instructor-led class. Um, so the on-prem is built around the pricing from that point of view. The cloud is licensed in a slightly different way. Um, because there is obviously no requirement for uh, individual piece of hardware, um, it, it's done on a per user basis. Um, so at the moment, the, the smallest license we have there is a 10 user license um, that obviously covers the individual um, for full access to the our, our cloud version of the range for 12 months. Um, just a recap, both on-prem and cloud is subscription-based. Um, so it is a, um, you know, either a 12, 24, 36 months uh, license. Most people tend to go for a 12-month um, a license initially. Um, when it comes to um, a, a slightly different model, a, a, a rather than a SIL through as opposed to a SIL 2, where we've got some partners that actually want to run this as a managed service and incorporate the product as part of um, their own training, uh, rather than licensing, licensing it per user, we would actually then license it to the partner on number of training days. And the entry level for that is 25 training days. So uh, two, two fundamental models on the cloud front, you've got um, when you're selling it to a, tra a training organization uh, or a managed service provider, you would buy a number of days. If you're selling it directly to the customer, it would be number of users. Just trying to see. Um, in terms of arranging uh, the, the, the training that uh, Tony spoke about, um, most certainly that's something that we can we can obviously organise. I think what would be um, uh, obviously logical is, is to understand your team's uh, capabilities. This is you know the the, the probably the, the the key element over here. You, you would have seen through Tony's demo that um, uh, this is aimed at obviously SOC teams and incident responders as opposed to general population. So. Uh, if your business type is acting as a um, remote SOC for your uh, for your customers, then you know those individuals will have the correct skill level. Um, so let's obviously um, circle back to uh, Morali in terms of people that want to take part in the training. Um, and uh, you know we can then obviously organise. You know if it's a ransomware attack or whatever the the, the scenario uh, might be, we can organise that. That's not a problem whatsoever. Um, in terms of costing, um, it, it, it does vary slightly from, from an MSRP point of view. Um, uh, it, you know, it, typically on, on the cloud element, you're looking at about $100,000 uh, list price for, for the 10 users for the year. Um, that obviously gives them you know, full access to the system. Um, most certainly, uh, the, the, this is based around uh, full access to our, our system. Um, and you, again, if you guys have had a look at um, uh, cyber range and the, the, the vertical, and if you look at some of the competitors, the prices can obviously vary dramatically. 
But one of the key uh, areas to, to uh, obviously keep in mind when you're looking at different pro uh, costings is what you're actually investing in. Um, we don't use open source, um, we're using real world technology. Um, and probably more importantly, it's um, simulation based uh, as opposed to a lab based environment. So that does naturally have an impact on the costing side of things because it's as real world as, uh, as one can get it. But, you know, from a, uh, in terms of scoping out individual projects, um, you know, let's, let's obviously look at that on a, on a case by case basis. Just trying to see if there's any other questions that have, that have cropped up. Um, uh, just maybe a couple of points to, to obviously um, raise again. Um, I know Tony did cover this off. Um, you know, fundamentally, that there, there is uh, technically a couple of differences as to why uh, an organisation would be looking at on-prem versus cloud. Tony obviously mentioned this in the presentation, you know, but I'll give it a, a quick summary. Uh, uh, if I put it into two buckets, one's going to be customization, and the other one's going to be volume uh, of trainees. So when you look at it from a volume point of view, if they start looking at 80 plus uh, individuals that they're looking to train throughout the course of the year, so universities most certainly would fall into this bucket, large enterprises, FSI, et cetera, um, on-prem then starts to make financial sense. The other element around that is, if I call it under the customization banner, um, so if they want to replicate the network topology that they have, if they want to um, have uh, um, coverage for an OT network, if they want to do red versus blue teaming, those technical aspects uh, would then, uh, you know, have a customer look at the on-prem as opposed to the cloud element. Uh, cloud, I think, is is um, you know most certainly a great tool for um, if I call it slightly smaller organisations in terms of SOC team size or organisations that like um, to train on a little bit more of um, uh, default networks and default technologies. Um, then it works quite perfectly. And then also, as I mentioned before, um, it, uh, it's most certainly aimed at um, uh, managed security providers or, or resellers that are wanting to sell it as a service. Again, you know, there's no uh, big investment in the hardware component. Um, you're utilizing our, our platform. Um, how many training modules are included, uh, which means how many training users can be done on the cloud? So, so um, at the moment, uh, we, we've got around 40 scenarios uh, is what we refer to, if you call it from a library point of view, and you saw on Tony's slide the individual components, um, whether that be a ransomware, um, a dragonfly attack, et cetera. Um, our team is obviously adding to that library, if I, if I put it this way, um, as new threats come out, we, we obviously add to that. In terms of the cloud uh, uh, training module, um, uh, you know, the individuals have access to that over a 12-month period, so they can obviously train um, as often as they like. And um, what's interesting, and Tony touched on this briefly, is um, an instructor-led course, uh, you know, uh, on the exact same scenario, so let's take ransomware as, a, as an example, um, the instructor can make that uh, um, more difficult if he, if he, you know, sees an individual is uh, able to deal with the threat in a far easier way. So although, you know, today there's 40 different um, individual scenarios by default that somebody can take, uh, within those uh, individual scenarios, they can be adjusted to be slightly more difficult um, or, or slightly easier. And this is where the, the instructor has obviously um, a good part to play in that, in that scenario. Um, is there a minimum SOC size for training? Uh, how, how long scenarios take to complete? So um, most certainly on-prem, just by the, the, you know, as I mentioned before, it's generally aimed at much larger organizations uh, or organizations that want customization. There, there's no um, minimum size uh, as per se. On the cloud element, um, yes, most certainly, you know, we, we've put a minimum threshold of, you know, 10. But, um, you, you know, if it's a, a key account, uh, you know, it's something that we can look at, obviously, to, to, to physically reduce that number. But obviously, having the managed service offering, uh, again, you know, opens up uh, the door for uh, customers of, you know, maybe that's got one or two uh, SOC members. Um, and as far as the training scenarios go, um, th th they, they do dramatically, right? And we've got some uh, training scenarios that could take eight hours. Um, we've got some training scenarios that could take an hour. The, 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 the key difference from a uh, training platform like ours as opposed to a lab-based environment 
is it's replicating what happens in the real world. So you don't uh, you don't have the opportunity to push pause, go away, do something else, and then come back and continue because that doesn't happen in the real world. When attack unfolds, you have to see the attack through. Most certainly, um, the instructor um, has the opportunity to um, you know stop the scenario. But then, uh, you know, an individual would have to go and start that from the beginning again. It, it's not a case that they can pick up from where they left off, because as I said, that doesn't uh, that doesn't happen in the real world. It's it's not a game. What you'll find with the lab-based environments, um, you know, you most certainly can, can push pause, go away, do something else, you know, come back a few days later and continue. Um, that's obviously not what uh, what we're trying to do from a, a realistic training environment. Uh, how often do new attack scenarios are, you know, get updated? Can we simulate ATP level attacks uh, in the range platform? Um, so I'll, I'll let Tony answer the second second part in more detail. But um, as I as I mentioned, the the uh, the library, as I call it, you know, is being updated on a regular basis as our team, uh, you know, finds new threats or as we add new technologies into our system. Then obviously we we we, we continue to um, you know to update the scenarios. The cloud element by default will be updated on a far more regular basis because we're in control of that. Um, obviously, from an on-prem, um, that's generally something that customers want to schedule. Um, but as we release, uh, you know, a new scenario, um, obviously uh, the, the customer has the opportunity to update that uh, as and when they want. Tony, from your point of view, um, a, a, APT level of attacks uh, um, in, uh, in in the range platform, you know, can they be simulated? Uh, we do indeed. We include uh, a range of fileless attacks to exercise the techniques uh, and the detection mechanisms that you will need to apply to be able to respond to the kind of attacks that are not picked up by antivirus tools. Uh, and included in those scenarios, we also include a range of extensive uh, advanced persistent threat exercises, uh, which show lateral movement, extensive persistence being built into the system, and we expect the delegates not to give up once they've found the initial point of infection, but continue to find other infection vectors and other persistence mechanisms that the, uh, the attackers have used within the environment. So yes, we do everything from those uh, basics through to very advanced exercises that follow the full kill chain and persistence. Thank you very much. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, are there any other questions that we can answer for you at this stage?